Greetings, everybody. We're going to turn our attention now to the adrenal glands, and we're going to be talking about hyperadrenalism here. So an adrenal gland that is in overdrive. You can think of it that way. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right-hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos, and I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. And definitely feel free to subscribe to my channel, clicking that little button in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, you'll get notifications as I put more and more videos up. All right, so... The adrenal glands are responsible for a production of a number of things. Now, first of all, what you need to know is that we have an adrenal cortex, which is on the outside, and an adrenal medulla, which is on the inside. So the, uh, the adrenal cortex can be divided up into three layers, glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis, GFR. And the mnemonic is that it gets sweeter as you go deeper. So uh, aldosterone is produced in the outermost layer. Aldosterone, think it regulates salt. Um, so that's salty. Uh, cortisol is kind of in between. That's at the zona fasciculata. And then androgens, sex hormones. Sweet, right? Piece it together. And then at the medulla, we have catecholamine synthesis. So a completely different thing. We're not dealing there uh, so much with steroid-related hormones. We are dealing with, uh, with water-soluble hormones. Okay, now this is the uh, steroid synthesis pathway. So this is where all our steroid hormones come from, or at least most of them. Very important step here is this first step going from cholesterol to pregnenolone. There's an enzyme called desmolase. It's got some other names, but desmolase is partially under the control of ACTH. So that's kind of where ACTH fits into this picture uh, is that it can catalyze the initial step here. You probably recognize some of these other enzymes, particularly 21 uh, alpha hydroxylase. Um, these come into play when you're talking about those congenital adrenal hyperplasias. All right, so we're going to talk about hypercortisolism. We'll talk about hyperaldosteronism, and then uh, we're not going to talk about high epinephrine. Uh, we will save that for its own talk. So hypercortisolism is classically described as Cushing syndrome. Okay, that's not the same as Cushing disease. Any state of hypercortisolism is called Cushing syndrome. So even if you sat down and took a whole bottle of prednisone or you're you know, taking a ton of prednisone, you would induce essentially a Cushing syndrome. Now, would, would we call it that? No, we'd call it adverse effective medication. Uh, but Cushing syndrome is just excess cortisol. Now, Cushing's disease refers to a specific reason for having that excess cortisol, and that reason being a pituitary adenoma. Now, the symptoms of Cushing syndrome are classic. You've probably known this for a long time. It's very, very, very basic. So we think of weight gain, fat redistribution, that buffalo hump and moon facies. So they're not necessarily getting fat all over the place. They're getting fat in very particular places. Abdominal striae, those violaceous lines, and that's due to uh, thinning of the skin layers. Menstrual irregularities, why? Cortisol interferes with the release of gonadotropes, which is responsible for that nice cyclical menstrual cycle. Acne, facial plethora, redness of the face, hirsutism, hair growth in someone where it shouldn't be growing. Women should not be growing beards. Um, so if they start developing a beard, then you need to look at you know things like PCOS and Cushing's and stuff like that. Now, the findings on physical exam, you may see uh, the striae and you may see the acne and the hirsutism, but hypertension is also very common uh, with Cushing's. The best initial test is a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. That's the first one we go for. Why? Because measuring the cortisol is a pain in the butt. In order to measure cortisol and get a measurement that you can use that's going to be useful for you, uh, you have to collect their urine for 24 hours. Nobody wants to do that. So the first thing that we do is essentially a screening test. So if you give low-dose dexamethasone, I believe it's like one milligram, and there is a failure to suppress the cortisol, the cortisol does not go down, then you are dealing with a Cushing syndrome. What kind? We don't know, but you're dealing with a Cushing syndrome. If, on the other hand, it does suppress, uh, then what you're dealing with is a something else. It's not Cushing's. 
Okay, so normal excludes hypercortisolism of any kind. Now, that's the best initial test. The most accurate test is what I was just referring to, that 24-hour urine free cortisol. Now, serum ACTH can be useful because that can help us determine whether it's primary or secondary. And you just need to think back to your physiology and that negative feedback. If the adrenal gland is making a ton of cortisol all on its own, it's going to suppress ACTH release. And so primary would be low ACTH. And then the opposite, if you have lots of ACTH made by an ACTH secreting tumor or uh, pituitary adenoma, then you would have high ACTH and high cortisol. Okay, this is moon facies. This is probably, these are probably uh, children who are on uh, prednisone, maybe for cancer. Um, so it's often part of chemotherapy regimens. And so you can get this. Uh, it would be unusual for a, a child to develop Cushing's disease, although I suppose it can happen. Um, you can, again, just see how these changes occur in these people. This is the buffalo hump here. Um, so this is just unusual distribution of fat, and this is classic in Cushing's. These are the abdominal striae. This is, these are not stretch marks. A lot of people look at these and they think they're stretch marks, which is what you get from gaining or losing weight really quickly. This is due to thinning of the skin. So you start to see these sort of underlayers of the tissue, and that's abdominal striae, and unfortunately these are permanent. So even more uh, dramatic of an appearance, kind of Gives me the heebie-jeebies a little bit. Okay, this is truncal obesity, not super specific. You get a lot of people, I mean, I'm sure you've seen like 50 of these guys at the beach in a given day. All right, so the first step is mentioned, low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. Really, this just answers the question, is there abnormal cortisol secretion? If the cortisol remains elevated, then you're dealing with a hypercortisolism. If it suppresses, if it goes back to normal, uh, then you need to consider alternative diagnoses. Now, when you get a positive low-dose test, then your next step is going to be a 24-hour urine-free cortisol. That is confirmatory, and it is also the most accurate test. Um, there, it is possible to get false positives in the low-dose test, and so this is often why we use this to confirm. Uh, however, you don't necessarily need to do it. We typically reserve it for people who are at risk for false positives. So people who are on anti-epileptic drugs, uh, people with eating disorders, even depression or alcohol withdrawal. Okay, um, now once a patient has been diagnosed with Cushing syndrome, then the next step, uh, if you, whether or not you decide to go forward with the 24 hour urine cortisol, is to determine whether or not there's a pituitary adenoma, which is the, one of the most common causes. And so in order to do that, we get a high dose dexamethasone suppression test. And so if you are able to suppress, um, then well, actually I have a picture here. Uh, so if you are able to suppress, um, then what you are dealing with is Cushing's disease, the pituitary adenoma. If there is no response, then what you likely have is a uh, either an ACTH secreting tumor that's not pituitary related or an adrenal neoplasia. Um, so in that case, you have a, a, a tumor, either malignant or benign, that is releasing cortisol all by itself. Uh, all right, so I still have some illustrations here. So this is basically what I just said. If you have a patient who's presumed to have Cushing's disease, if they suppress on the high-dose test, then you know they've got an adenoma and you need to localize it. So you would get an MRI. That would be your next step. If there's no response, then we want to know, is this a primary or a secondary uh, hypercortisolism? And so obviously then you're going to get the ACTH level. If the ACTH level is low, it means you've got negative feedback. In other words, the cortisol is coming from the adrenal glands, primary hypercortisolism. If the ACTH is high, it's the ACTH that's running the show. All right, and go back here. Okay, so this is uh, some uh, pictures of adrenal adenomas. Um, this uh, right here and this right here, you can see that uh, they are um, just superior to the kidneys. Um, so it helps to be able to, I mean, you should have a general idea of where the adrenal gland is, but uh, on an exam, they may show you multiple slices. Now, if you look at a coronal view, it's a lot more obvious. So this is the adrenal adenoma here. You can see it just sits superior to that uh, superior pole of the kidney. 
The treatment of choice for any kind of adenoma or neoplasia causing Cushing syndrome is just to go in and resect it. Uh, they may ask you what the best approach is for a pituitary adenoma, i.e. Cushing's disease, and that would be a transphenoidal resection. Adrenal tumors that cannot be resected are treated medically, and here we're going for things that uh, reduce the amount of cortisol synthesis. And so ketoconazole is a good one, metiropone, and there are a lot of other drugs. Mifepristone is actually used uh, occasionally. So this is basically what we just went through. Now, hyperaldosteronism also comes in a variety of flavors, primary and secondary. Primary meaning that it's made at the adrenal. Secondary means something else is controlling it. Um, so the one we're going to talk about here is uh, an aldosterone-secreting adrenal neoplasia that's called Kahn syndrome. So remember that aldosterone is under the... Uh, it, it's part of that renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So you're supposed to, if you have high aldosterone, you're supposed to have high renin because renin controls it. If you have high aldosterone and low renin, then you know that you're dealing with something making aldosterone on its own. And so this is something I made. You don't necessarily need to memorize it, but this will help you. I mean, you should know this from step one, uh, but uh, this will help you kind of visualize it. I also put uh, some drugs and where they work. So release is normally regulated by the RAS syndrome, and uh, basically the way it works is renin is released when the juxtaglomerular cells uh, sense low blood pressure, low perfusion. Renin is released. Renin catalyzes the formation of angiotensin 1 from angiotensinogen. Angiotensin 1 gets converted to angiotensin 2 at the lungs by ACE, and angiotensin 2 is the bioactive form uh, that does many things, but one of the more important things that it does is helps release aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone stimulates uh, the nephron to reabsorb sodium, and with it comes water, so consequently, it will increase blood pressure. Now, when you reabsorb sodium, uh, what's going to happen then is going to come at the expense of potassium. So with high states of aldosterone, you're going to have a hypernatremia and a hypokalemia. Okay, but particularly the hypokalemia, that's going to be more salient. Okay, uh, so this is, okay, so we talked about uh, hyperaldosteronism. I just want to briefly bring up secondary hyperaldosteronism. So in this case, what's happening is that it's due to the high renin. You're not just getting ectopic aldosterone production. Um, so that can happen for a variety of, of reasons. If the kidneys think that they're not being perfused enough, i.e. bilateral renal artery stenosis, uh, then they're going to just flood the blood with renin. Um, so that would be a secondary hyperaldosteronism. It's secondary to the high renin. Barter syndrome and Little syndrome are channelopathies. Uh, they reduce, uh, slightly reduce the amount of water resorption due to uh, a reduction in sodium reabsorption. Consequently, they have a mild hypovolemia, and so they need to uh, they they need to secrete aldosterone to try to uh, to try to protect that. All right, um, you can read up on licorice if you want. So the symptoms of hyperaldosteronism are fairly nonspecific, weakness, headache, polyuria, polydipsia. Um, they can have hypertension just because they're reabsorbing more salt and water. The labs will show hypernatremia and hypokalemia. They can also get a metabolic alkalosis, and that's because... When you have high levels of potassium in the blood, you're not going to reabsorb as much potassium, and so the expense will come at hydrogen ions, acid. And so you're going to acidify your urine more. Okay, I'm not going to get too far into the physiology there, but do know that hypokalemia tends to coexist with metabolic acidosis, and hyperkalemia tends to coexist with metabolic alkalosis. The best initial test for suspected hyperaldosteronism is simple. It's a urine aldosterone level. And you should also get a plasma renin level because those two together will tell you, do I have hyperaldosteronism? If so, is it primary or secondary? An elevated urine aldosterone is obviously a sine qua non for hyperaldosteronism. You can look at this aldosterone to renin ratio if you want. Um, that's not very high yield for exams. Uh, so on confirmation of hyperaldosteronism, uh, then the best next step is an abdominal CT. We're looking for an adrenal adenoma here. That would be definition of Kahn syndrome. And this would be treated surgically. However, medical treatment, if you're going to go that route, the best drug is spironolactone. Mm -hmm.